Uh, good evening, uh, everybody, and welcome to the last session of day six. Uh, this is a talk titled uh, Dissident New Media Femin uh, Femininities and Hindi Cinema. I'm repeating the title Dissident New Media Femininities and Hindi Cinema. And the uh, lecture would be delivered by Dr. Tanushri Ghosh. Uh, Dr. Tanushri Ghosh is an associate professor of English at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Her research and teaching uh, interests are in the fields of 19th century studies, visual and cinema studies, and post-colonial studies. Her work has been published in journals such as the Journal of Visual Culture, Victorian Literature and Culture, Neo-Victorian Studies, and Jump Cut. Her talk today is drawn from her essay in the anthology entitled Bollywood's New Woman to be published by Rutgers University Press shortly. Uh, Dr. Ghosh uh, teaches uh, in the United States and, and because of the time difference, it was not possible for her to be uh, you know, to jo for her to join us at this point of time, it's it's uh, dead of the night there. So she has sent us a recorded lecture, uh, which uh, I would request my colleague uh, uh, Ravinder to play. Uh, and also at the end of this, um, you know, uh, uh, since there is uh, there isn't going to be an interactive session, uh, Dr. Ghosh has very graciously uh, mentioned that you know I would be sharing her email ID and uh, and and the. A person who's in charge of the WhatsApp group can post it there. She said anybody who has any questions, queries with regard to her lecture is most welcome to email her and, and uh, his or her questions to her. Um, with that introduction uh, and a warm welcome, I would uh, request Ravinder to please uh, play her recorded lecture. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tha Kosh, and I'm very pleased to be um, sharing my work, Reshaping Bollywood, Dissident New Media, Femininities, and Hindi Cinema with you all this afternoon. I'm sorry I couldn't be here in person, but um, the time difference is such that it would be in the middle of the night for me. Um, I also uh, am recording in a bit of a rush because I had another conference right before this event. So I apologize for the talking head. Um, I have some clips lined up um, towards the later half of the paper, um, but um, for I think the first 20 minutes is just going to be, it's just going to be me. So I'll just sort of get right into it. In a 2018 roundtable discussion among Hindi film producers conducted by Anupama Chopra, participants such as Siddharth Roy Kapoor and Karan Johar bemoaned the inevitable decline of Bollywood, citing the rise of digital media and the lack of relevant content as key reasons for shrinking audiences at film theaters. Indeed, digital content available for consumption online has exploded in the last decade. Since the early 2000s, state and private investments in digital infrastructures and communication technologies have led to growing internet access, as well as the emergence of a robust digital culture in India. Ashwin Punathambekar and Sriram Mohan remark, quote, Indeed, the meteoric growth of local language internet users just in the Indian context, from 42 million in 2011 to 234 million by 2016, signals the emergence of vernacular practices that challenge Anglo-centric understandings of digital cultures. South Asia thus serves not so much as a strictly defined geographic region, but rather as a site from which to examine the intersections of local, national, regional, inter-regional, continental, and global forces that shape contemporary digital cultures." End quote. The rising demographic of India's population aged less than 30 with privileged access to social media and cheap data plans 
has also greatly contributed to the success of streaming channels offering digital content. The last few years have seen the rise of streaming channels, including TVF, which produces hugely popular original web series such as Pictures, Permanent Roommates, Tripling, and Ye Meri Family. With 12 million cumulative views in two years, Permanent Roommates, for instance, is now one of the most viewed series on YouTube anywhere in the world. Netflix has also joined the bandwagon with original content through shows such as Ghoul, Lust Stories, and Sacred Games. Lust Stories was, according to a CNN Tech article, quote, more popular with Netflix users in India than House of Cards or Narcos were with Netflix users in the United States when they were first released. End quote. YouTube now is replete with short films, web series, reaction videos, and parodies that present a different, more youthful face of urban India than what usually may be found in Hindi cinema. For this talk, I focus mostly on Large Short Films, a production company set up by Royal Stag Barrel's Select Whiskey, and two very popular web series, TVF's Permanent Roommates and Little Things. The latter series, Little Things, started as a filter copy and Dice Media web series, but was acquired by Netflix for its second season. Large Short Films has produced short films that have won awards at multiple film festivals. Reportedly, the platform has achieved 267 plus million reach, 627 plus million views, 5.5 plus subscribers on YouTube, and more than, a one, more than 1 million followers on Facebook with an engagement rate of 5%. This is a data from one, one a newspaper article on this particular production company. The short films often feature actors such as Manoj Bajpayee, Radhika Apte, and Shifali Shah, and directors such as Anurag Kashyap, Imtiaz Ali, and Sujay Ghosh, who are well known for their work in Hindi films. Recent web series like Sacred Games, Mirzapur, Ghul, and Made in Heaven also feature well-known actors from the Hindi film fraternity like Nawazuddin Siddiqui, Saif Khan, and Kalki Kekla. Their roles in short films and web series build on and add to their star or directorial texts in interesting ways. Additionally, actors from miniseries such as Sumit Vyas from Permanent Roommates and Mithila Palkar from Little Things move between the digital space and Hindi cinema, carrying their new media star texts with them and implicitly shaping respective content in both new media and Bollywood. So there's a a um, lot of um, uh, movement between these mediums of the traditional film industry and the sort of the digital culture that is now emerging. In this talk, I explore how new media narratives resist the representational paradigm often spotted in post-liberalization Hindi cinema, wherein the Indian women's negotiation of tradition and modernity recuperates and confused cinematic forms of nationalism. Unlike the hero-centric narratives in mainstream Hindi cinema, which remain the norm, even with the emergence of multiplex cinemas and diverse scripts, the short films overwhelmingly feature women protagonists, while the web series present women characters as equal subjects of narrative attention. The identificatory dynamic found in this emergent digital new media complicates the normative tropes in Hindi cinema of the woman as either love interest, self-effacing wife or mother, or wronged avenger. So essentially what I'm interested in doing for this talk is to outline for you how this emergent um, digital culture offers us um, new models um, and perhaps slightly subversive models of femininity that we don't find even in post-liberalization um, multiplex cinema, which uh, attempts to push the envelope uh, in terms of representation, but um, as I read it, still stops short. Significant differences such as corporate sponsorship, streaming content, and the immediacy of audience interaction and feedback allow for forms of storytelling in new media that are more transgressive as compared with Hindi cinema which remains bound by both its cinematic representational traditions, which reflect dominant cultural ideologies, and the more repressive control of the censor board. 
While the censorship of streaming content is very much a contentious issue in India, the lack of consensus and still indeterminate government policy have resulted in representational freedom in digital content to a degree not seen in Hindi cinema. I posit that the of these chances in production, circulation, and most significantly, reception, generates forms of femininity and gender dynamics that are novel and subversive, and that offer sites to dissent against Hindi cinema's hegemonic gender ideologies. This essay, then, is also an investigation of the relationship between the new woman and new media or an exercise in assessing how opting out of mainstream Hindi film format opens up new modes of representation of the post-liberalization femininities. I should clarify that I depend on the definition of new media that, quote, identifies it with the use of a computer for distribution and exhibition the production. Lev Manovich observes that, Quote, today we are in the middle of a new media revolution, the shift of all culture to computer-mediated forms of production, distribution, and communication. The computer media revolution affects all stages of communication, including acquisition, manipulation, storage, and distribution. It also affects all types of media, texts, still images, moving images, sound, and spatial constructions. End quote. I would say that in terms of the one sort of tweak that I would offer in terms of the understanding of computer, I think that I would include smartphones in understanding them as a device that is very similar to the computer, except that it's mobile. Robert Logan also characterizes new media as, quote, very easily processed, stored, transformed, retrieved, hyperlinked, and perhaps most radical of all, easily searched for and accessed, end quote. An important point of distinction between older forms of mass media and new media lies in the collaborative and interactive role of viewers. The short films and web series that I discuss here definitely do not allow interactivity along the lines of gaming platforms, or even, for instance, a viewer-driven media experience, such as the interactive episode recently, recently as in, um, I would say, about three years ago. Um, offered by the Netflix dystopian series Black Mirror, where users could, could choose um, how the plot would progress. So there, there were options built into the viewing process. However, they do operate within the interface of YouTube and digital channels, granting viewers ease of access across a range of screens, as well as avenues of immediate response and debate in the comment section. The short films and web series also routinely provide fodder for another form of online community and YouTube genre called reaction channels. Reaction channels such as Jabi Koe, Our Stupid Reactions, Pakistani Reacts, and Korean Dosts, to name a few, cater to Indian viewers who prefer to watch the trailers, short films, and web series with the hosts of these channels and carry on discussion in the comment section. Viewers subscribe to these reaction channels, suggest trailers and web series that the hosts might react to, and watch or rewatch this content with the hosts. And this is also a very interesting phenomenon. And uh, my next uh, piece is actually focused on um, strange uh, cultural phenomena of the reaction channels. At a time when Hindi cinema moves towards the epic and spectacular, with films such as Bahubali, Bajirao Mastani, Padmavat, and Mani Karnika, attempting to woo audiences back to the theaters. Digital content being produced represents a radical turn towards the ordinary lived experience, mostly pertaining to urban and middle-class India, but offering a representational paradigm distinctly different from commercial Hindi cinema. In doing so, the script writers and directors of the short films and web series invoke the middle cinema of the 1970s to explain their deviation from the standard representational norms of Bollywood. The cinema of Rishikesh Mukherjee, Sai Paranjpe, and Basu Bhattacharya. For instance, Jaydeep Sarkar, the director of Nayantara's Necklace, a short film about the toxic social aspirations of the Indian middle class, explains that his film draws from his observations of middle class life. He says, quote, Hindi films are mostly seen as an escape. Whether it is the audiences or the filmmakers, they don't want to see their daily troubles on screen. 
cinema has become time pass. I don't think the, there are films right now which talk about the monotony of life, which we saw in the films of the 70s. Govind Nilani's Party was one such film, which talks about us, end quote. Mithila Palkar, saying the role of Kavya in the runaway hit web series, Little Things, reiterates this sentiment. Quote, our show is about little things. It's not dramatic. There is no deliberate conflict in it. We have not gone out of our way to make it more dramatic. It is about, to try, it is about trying to find the fun in the mundane, end quote. Madhav Prasad has argued that the Hindi film industry countered the establishment of the National Film Development Corporation in 1975 as a quote unquote parallel industry with an alternative aesthetic program. With middle class cinema characterized by an aesthetic of authenticity and simplicity. Films such as Anand, Bhaji, Rajdi Ganta, Chhoti and Katha, they're all in 1970 and uh, Katha is 1982, so 70s and uh, up to mid 80s successfully combined commercial motives with realistic representation of middle-class lives and struggles. Middle cinema, as per Prasad's reading, was invested in asserting the national role of the middle class and consolidating middle-class identity around issues that dealt with class-based anxieties, particularly around the susceptibility of women, post-marital tensions, the problem of urban space, and the difficulty of privacy for young couples. I posit that the emergent new media in India, especially digital short films and web series, not only negotiates a nexus between social relevance and commercial interests, similar to middle cinema, but also, and more importantly, allows a comparable focus on the everyday lived experience, which often does not find expression in Hindi cinema. Not all new media is progressive or dissident, just because of formal or generic differences from mainstream cinema or media. But as Mark Whittaker argues, the internet's Habermasian presence can potentially act as, and quote, an alternative but proximate political landscape and provide a counter context in which different possibilities can be displayed by people who would otherwise be constrained from speech and who can now speak to audiences they would otherwise be unable to reach, end quote. Significantly then, thus while not entirely post-cinematic, these short films initiate a different aesthetic, affective, and cultural paradigm that introduces the quotidian as a valid modality of subject formation and articulating lived experience. The establishing shots in most short films under analysis in this talk situate the narratives firmly within the middle-class domestic space. Worn appliances, peeling wall paint, clothes drying in hallways and cramped kitchens constitute these spaces. I'm sorry I don't have, didn't have the time for screenshots, but when I play clips for you later, I'm hoping that you'll kind of catch on to those, those details as well again. The lighting is low-key, emphasizing the everydayness of the space and of the characters who inhabit it. We often see close-ups of hands preparing food or tea in the kitchen. These sequences are slow-paced, taking their time and asking viewers to invest in actions, and by extension, ways of life that do not usually find representation in commercial filmic storytelling. Tracking shots follow subjects as they navigate the stairways and passages connecting rooms, often very cramped spaces of their homes. Interestingly, the narrative rarely ventures out of the home. The focus on the domestic space is intense and rarely interrupted. The dialogue, too, in most short films, but particularly the web series, is a recognizable urban hybrid that intermingles Hindi and English. Characters switch registers from speaking formally in the office to casually using swear words with friends. The use of this hybrid language, peppered with na, to, yar, opens up a linguistic paradigm different from the Hindi-Urdu base of Hindi cinema. While this admixture of Hindi and English, the swift move from one language to another, or the easy combination of both to create a new hybrid form, signifies an urban, privileged use of language 
It is not to be confused with the hybridity that springs from the lack of access to English. Instead, the language of these refugees creates a space that is representative of urban middle class Indian youth and their experience. These aesthetic choices, coupled with a focus on female protagonists, also seems to resonate with feminist film practices that emphasize, to use Pam Cook's phrase, quote, the personal, the intimate, the domestic, end quote. While Cook looks at how feminist artisanal cinema recuperates the discourse of the domestic in cinema by making, quote, the family, the home, personal and sexual relationships, the loci of drama and struggle. Her insight is useful in understanding the focus on the domestic and personal in the emergent new media in contemporary Indian digital culture. We see the diegetic use of everyday feminine sounds, such as the background noise of TVs, the whirring of pedestal fans, water dripping in air coolers, and utensils clanging in the kitchen sink. But moments of personal crisis do not come packaged with non diegetic musical cues. In films such as Anurag Kashyap's The Day After That Day, the background news of sexual violence against women and children remains a constant as we see women in the film not only get ready for work, but also ready themselves to head out and face their harassers. Neeraj Gaywan's Juice opens with a black screen with the recognizable voice of the Indian journalist Barkhadat discussing the 2016 US elections. That counters the oft-repeated criticism of Hillary Clinton being unlikable by pointing out that, that that particular charge is often levied against tough women that don't conform to a feminine stereotype. That's commentary is interrupted by the raucous laughter of men who go on to criticize their new female boss. And all of this ha happens with the opening credits and a black screen. So we don't even see, we hear it orally even before we see things happen visually. So all of this diegetic work happens at the oral level before the fade-in reveals the female protagonist Manju, played by Shifa Alisha, kneeling on the floor, clearing leftover food from the coffee table, around which her husband and his colleagues are sitting, drinking, and snacking. We witness a familiar scene of gender-segregated spaces in the home. The husband and his male colleagues occupy the living room, a space of leisure, pleasure, and public discourse, while Manju and the other women mostly remain in the kitchen, a space of discomfort and labor, but also a space filled with rich conversations about their private lives, as well as the pressures of social norms and expectation. Manju's husband and his colleagues drink and discuss local and world politics, significantly endorsing Donald Trump's brand of powerful masculinity. Women occupy the kitchen and the space of domestic labor. I'll share my screen. The kitchen is also a communal space, but conversations happen intermittently between work and despite the stifling heat. As the film evokes pure sympathy for women, especially Manju, who is simultaneously cooking, trying to attend to her, to the comfort of her guests in the kitchen and shooing children away from the living room at her husband's behest, through Parbatia, the domestic worker, the film also highlights that discussions of patriarchy and power are further complicated by caste and class in India. 
We see oppressive norms move across generations as a young girl is cherry picked from a room full of children to serve dinner to her brothers. The moment of protest in this film is powerful in its simplicity. I'm going to share my screen again, and I think I'll stay in this share screen mode for a bit because I want to show you a couple of clips. Um, so this is 11.07. Let's see if I can. Oh, no. Forgive that. So the moment of protest is powerful in its simplicity. Manju pours herself a glass of fruit juice, drags a plastic chair into the living room, and places it in front of the air cooler. She sits in front of the cool air, sips the juice, and looks at the men who have been startled into silence. Much as in the day after that day. And I'll show you a little clip from that as well. The, it, this is a film directed by that day after every day. Uh, this film, um, Directed by Andrew. I'd like to show you a little bit of it and then talk about it. goes on in that way. This is the ending of the film, um, Ship's film, where the fight between harassed women and their abusers is terrible in its silence, interrupted only by visceral grunts and shrieks. Silence and juice is also a crucial aesthetic choice and is used strategically. The articulation of protest and anger happens silently, without fanfare, and with a tight close-up of Manju's face and no verbal outbursts. Significantly, the film's conclusion again invokes the idea of the unlikable woman. Manju's minor revolt against the everyday experience of the unequal distribution of labor within the home and gender-segregated spaces does not reverse the patriarchal power dynamic. The simple move of claiming a place in the room of comfort and leisure is unlikable. Protest, one would say, happens in the realm of affect. Building on Elaine Scarry's work, Vivian Sopchak notes, quote, in so far as the photographic, the cinematic, and the electronic have each been objectively constituted as a new and discrete technologic, each also has been subjectively incorporated, enabling a new and discrete perceptual mode of existential and embodied presence. 
in some as they have mediated and represented our engagement with the world, with others, and with ourselves, photographic, cinematic, and electronic technologies have transformed us so that we presently see, sense, and make sense of ourselves as quite other than we were before each of them existed." End quote. These formations in Indian new media thus represent existing cultural values, but are all attractive of subjectivity extending and complicating how viewers make sense of the world and understand themselves. One of the most visible configurations of identity is the formation of dissident femininities in new media. The emergent Indian new media opens up a different paradigm wherein to situate potentially more progressive formulations of gender identities, specifically femininities, as compared with Hindi cinema's reactionary turn as a response to global media. From the 1990s onwards, factors such as the influx of foreign money and international cultural influences, the increased visibility and appeal of the Hindu right, as well as the growing influence of the Indian diaspora in liberalized India, have generated cultural discourses that consolidated traditional gender roles, sometimes to reactionary proportions. Leela Fernandez and Jenny Sharp, among others, have commented on how the Hindi film heroine, such as in films like Dilwale Dulhania Le Jayenge and Pardes, become the site of identity politics that takes shape in that took a, takes a specific shape in post-liberal India. Fernandez observes, quote, the potential disruption of globalization and cultural hybridity is managed through a remapping of the nation's boundaries through a politics of gender, which center around conflicts over the preservation of the purity of women's sexuality, a process which once again conflates the preservation of nationness with the protection of women. End quote. However, I would like to suggest here that instead of a singular reactionary turn towards a discourse on purity and Indian traditional values, the new woman in Indian film, TV, and media might be better understood as a more complex culturally hybrid figure. Rupal Oza, for instance, offers the possibility of complicating the narrative about representation, gender, particularly femininity and global modernities. The creation of the new liberal Indian woman was registered in several discursive locations, such as the magazine articles, television, fictional narratives, and talk shows. Together, these narratives generated a visible public archive in which the new woman entered as an icon of modernity. And yet Oza points out that these newer models of modern femininities did not completely break away from the patriarchal network. Instead, these identities renegotiated modernities around existing and new forms of gender-based inequalities and oppressions. Uh, so the reading of the film English Winglish, for instance, also offers another um, sort of way of understanding how the post-liberalization new woman um, traverses domestic and global space. Um, at the same time, like Oza has suggested, negotiates her identity around the kind of patriarchal, existing patriarchal uh, um, inequalities. In Hindi cinema, I'm skipping a little bit uh, in the interest of time. In um, the kind of newer uh, films, in let's say from the 2000s onwards, um, there have been several attempts to imagine the new woman on screen, such as Queen, Dangal, Tumhari Sulu, and so on. But it has more or less operated within normative cultural parameters of femininity. Rani in Queen travel brought to quote unquote find herself since such explorations would presumably be harder to situate in her West Delhi neighborhood. Dangal is an ambiguous narrative of female empowerment, given the female protagonist's utter lack of agency and her father's rejection of everything that is feminine in his desire to transform his daughters into effective wrestlers. Tumhari Sulu features a housewife turned late night radio show host who grapples with the lopsided power dynamic in her family as a result of her newfound career and resolves it finally by jumpstarting her husband's catering business. Of course, after the 1990s, there are Hindi films that push the envelope when it comes to articulating a new woman, such as No One Kill Jessica, Tanu Vets Manu, Tanu Vets Manu Returns, Kahani, Part 1 and 2, Mary Com, Margarita with a Straw, Nirja, Secret Superstar, Pataka, Razi, the kind of, the, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, robust list. Most of these films did well commercially and critically. However, they are still promoted and discussed as exceptional narratives featuring woman-centric plots which are hutki or different from typical hero-oriented stories found in Hindi cinema. 
More importantly, while overlaps are certainly discernible between recent woman-centric Hindi cinema and new media, most characters in the previously mentioned Hindi films are placed in extraordinary circumstances, such as murders, a hostage crisis, domestic abuse, or espionage. Stories about ordinary female protagonists negotiating everyday problems, just complications in the workplace, relationship issues, and identity crises are far and few. Consider, for instance, the topic of premarital or extramarital sex. In most Hindi cinema, extramarital relationships have functioned as sensational ways of showcasing the hero's moral decline. A filmic shorthand would usually be to show a dance number at a courtesan's establishment or a quota. While premarital sex usually led to tragic unwed mothers, such as Indulka Fool, Aradhana, Trishul. From 1990s onwards, sexploitation films such as Raz, Jism, and Murder also employed extramarital sex as a way to mark characters as morally ambiguous and visit human or supernatural punishment on them. In contrast to the rather polarized representation of sexuality within and without marriage in Hindi cinema, the vicissitudes of marriage also become uh, prominent themes in emergent new media. However, the topic is addressed without taking recourse to a binary morality. For example, Imtiaz Ali's Other Way employs the aesthetic of rewinding videotapes to offer a meditation on time and how going back in time changes and adds layers to our sense of characters, their actions and motivations versus a linear narrative. While the male narrator adds a jarring note of censure throughout, the film is interesting in ending with a photograph of the bride who, as viewers now know, carries the baggage of sexual past and flawed choices. As far as wedding movies go, this one definitely adds an angle we do not see often, if at all. Jyoti Kapoor Das's Chutney and Mansi Jain's Churi, 2016 and 2017, both featuring Tiska Chopra, revolve around the character of a wife whose spouse is cheating on her. Yet the films refuse to use the trope of the victimized wronged woman and instead employ dark comedy, adding agency to the wife's character. Shujai Ghosh's Ahilya also employs the trope of extramarital sex by invoking the mythological tale of a naive Ahilya who is tricked by the imposter demigod Indra and turned to stone for her unwitting adultery by her furious husband. In the film, however, the young wife becomes the object of desire without the eventual punishment. Shot predominantly from the point of view of the young male policeman who arrives at the artist's house while investigating the disappearance of a male model. The young wife of the artist played to perfection by Radhika Apte is immediately sexualized. As she leads the policeman to the living room, the officers gaze and the camera linger on her body. Still, the narrative refuses to pigeonhole her as a sex-starved young woman married to a much older man. The various touches that happen between her and the policeman, her fingers brushing against his, she hands him a cup of tea, her foot accidentally grazing his leg, seem shrouded in ambiguity. By combining the young woman's gestures, which are read as intentionally seductive by the policeman, with her obvious affection for her artist husband and candid expressions, the narrative refuses to immediately cast her in the role of a seductress. The ambiguity is critically significant as the narrative holds off moral censure of the young, seemingly promiscuous woman, thereby problematizing the policeman's one-sided desire for her. The film's morality takes on the proportions of a fairy tale. The policeman who has been objectifying young woman throughout the film ultimately becomes an object himself. A wooden miniature doll displayed in the showcase. At the end of the film, which seems to be a macabre social experiment on the psyche of the Indian male, another young man comes in through the door and the artist's wife wags her finger reprovingly at the policeman doll, telling him not to be naughty again. To reiterate by way of conclusion, emergent new media may be productively understood as engendering a space wherein the predominant representational paradigms of popular Hindi cinema may be resisted. It does so by validating the ordinariness of lived experience granted within the middle-class social spectrum, by exploring difficult, complex, and extraordinary issues such as sexual violence, uneven gender roles, and dysfunctional families through an aesthetics of the ordinary, and by representing as well as generating dissident ways of being. I had a small discussion of the web series as well, 
that I referenced at the beginning of the talk, the little uh, um, little things and permanent roommates. But in the interest of time, I'm skipping over that. Um, if at all uh, you're interested, um, please let me know and um, I can uh, forward that particular discussion to you. I will have uh, the organizers share my email uh, towards the end of my talk. I end this talk by offering another example that complicates our understanding of the new woman in India and how she might be represented on screen by considering the character of the transgender heroine Cuckoo in the Netflix crime drama Sacred Games. Cuckoo is represented as a gangster mole, the glamorous dancer who is the keep of Suleiman Issa, one of Mumbai's crime lords. As she climbs out of her Rolls Royce to enter an exclusive club, she embodies class, power, and beauty. All the elements that are missing from the life of the aspiring gangster Ganesh Gaitonde, who is still entrenched in the senior strata of the Mumbai underworld. Pivotal conversation between Cuckoo and Gaitonde takes place in front of mirrors. The self and its reflections serve as metaphors for an identity split between public presentation and self-perception. The crucial moment when Cuckoo's identity as a trans woman is revealed through frontal nudity is definitely a first for the Indian screen. Cuckoo's cry of despair, is this what you want to see? Let me see if I can, I, I might be going a little bit over time with this, but I'll just show you a little bit. Oh, so interestingly, I think it's Netflix sensing that the screen is being shared. <laughs> so unfortunately, I think I'll have to describe it for you. But you hear the raw uh, emotion in uh, sort of the actress Kubra say, portraying Kuku. Kuku's cry of despair, is this what you want to see, is not a moment of shaming, disgust, or even crude humor, as is often the case in Hindi cinema, where trans people are marginalized and mocked. In fact, it is helpful to understand the visual representation of the trans woman's body in light of E. Jessica Guthrie's observation that visual representation of gender variant trans bodies create, quote, sites of meaning, creation, sites of meaning creation beyond the mere erotic, end quote. And by interrupting the spectator's look and foregrounding a perceived incongruity in socially constructed understandings of sex and gender. In fact, Gaitonde's response to Kuku's frustration at perceiving herself as unfit for marriage and children not only rejects the heteronormative future, but also transcends the binary of whether the trans woman's body is or can be an object of desire for cisgender men. His vocabulary redirects attention away from sexual desire to affective care and concern for Kuku's well-being and happiness. I want your love and laughter, Gaitonde tells his distraught lover, offering an alternative model of happiness and future-oriented thought for themselves. In contrast to the etherealized and self-effacing wife and mother bound by a discourse of virtue and values often found in popular Hindi cinema, the representations of the new women in new media overlaps with the emergent new women in contemporary Hindi cinema in their desire to portray femininities unbound by a discourse of nationalism. Their stories are clearly set in urban, upper or middle class India, but are not about being Indian. That is, they are not coded in ways to appease or affirm nationalist models of femininities. While these narratives are certainly limited by class, caste and regional privilege, the new woman struggles centering around her body, sexuality, relationships, domestic oppression and or sexual violence articulate modern forms of feminine self-fashioning. Thank you. Well, what a power-packed and engaging uh, lecture that was. And I am really, really sorry, especially after hearing the talk that, you know, uh, I wish she was here, basically, to, because I'm sure many of us have many questions and many observations to make. Uh, but that was an extremely engaging talk, not only looking at, you know, the, uh, the birth of uh, the digital uh, media, new media, as we call it, as uh, was uh, referred to by Dr. Ghosh, okay, how it changes uh, the kind of demography that watches, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, views uh, uh, these, uh, the content of new media and how that in turn uh, kind of uh, influences the, the, the kind of narratives which are 
uh, are created and especially uh, you know this is then uh, seen through the lens of gender okay how the how uh, hindi films which shies away perhaps uh, from uh, moving beyond a point that space is taken up by digital media but ultimately i think uh, to some extent dr ghosh also seems to suggest that uh, perhaps even new media doesn't go far enough okay although it does push the envelope it does uh, question certain very very prevalent hegemonic stere <coughs> stereotypes not only with regard to how women are presented but you know how uh, the perspective is uh, through is uh, the uh, uh, digital media throws up is often through the eyes of the woman and therefore uh, it is a new perspective it enables a new kind of discussion engagement and i think we have seen a lot in fact uh, juice the short film that uh, dr ghosh uh, showed a clip of is a, a clip that i have used since the time juice came into uh, existence i have often shown that clip as an introduction to my students to a uh, study of uh, uh, feminist theory uh, so uh, i think uh, uh, engaging wonderful talk and uh, a good note to end the day with uh, i would uh, hand over now the uh, you know uh, the virtual uh, mic to the organizing committee to for them to sort of you know make any announcements if any thank you thank you to all the participants